some people, so we still were able to go with family and had a wonderful time, unlike anything. I'm sure, like I was talking to a few of you before church, it's like a feast unlike any other. We only had services on the two high days, um, and then the rest were on Zoom. So I had an opportunity to speak at the feast, but it was through Zoom, which is the first time I've ever done that at a feast where I'm sitting in my living room in the condo talking into a camera that I make shift out of my iPad that I was like stacking up things. My daughter was laughing at me the whole time as I was trying to stack up and find a way to, I can't speak sitting down. So sitting down at a, at a like everyone else would like sit at their desk and I couldn't do it. I just, I'm too this. So I couldn't do it. So it was very interesting for us. I, I will ask uh, before I get started uh, your prayers, if I could, uh, my wife's father was checked into the Cleveland clinic uh, a couple days ago. Uh, he had a heart, not a heart attack, I'm sorry, he did. He is, he has congestive heart failure, but they checked him in and he's going to be there over a week. Um, they had to shock his heart back into rhythm and then he is getting an ultrasound and likely a procedure done tomorrow. Um, so he'll be in there for a while. So obviously, in one more thing, we'll take 2020, has just become the weirdest year that I think we've all had. And it just obviously, this would be the time that something like that happened. So we'll, we'd ask your prayers for it. So, and I was thinking because of that, of how much 2020 has been weird. I think back to January and February. We'll do a thought exercise here before we get started. Can any of you remember January and February of this year? And does it not feel like it was five years ago? I was talking with my coworker and I were talking about this week. We, so January and February were crazy for us at work and we rolled out a big project. So we were working crazy hours. Uh, and, th and that was January and February. And then there was a lot of legislation stuff that actually happened at the state level this year that affects health care. So I was having to be involved in that and it was potentially going to cost jobs. So January and February were these super stressful months and we kept looking forward like, man, if we can just get to March and April, things will be fine. And lo and behold, that wasn't the case. <laughs> and so it seems to pile on and even more so Sean Connery died today for those of you who didn't see, which is also, it just, it just gets worse. Um, so I want you to think about that. So in light of all that, think about what this year has been like in the course of it in the amount of social isolation, the amount of change and, and, and depression and despair that has come on since January, February, March, if you will, depending on when you really want to say it really started and all that has gone on and wrapped into it and what that has done to the world, to the individual, to you on, on, on an individual level, from a family standpoint, as a congregation, everything's going on, it, it has been a lot. And in a way, it's very weird in that we have been isolated, but it feels loud. This year has felt loud to me. I don't watch a lot of live television. We usually have Netflix and, and Prime and do things like that, but I wanted to start watching footballs on now. So I started watching live TV, and the amount of political ads that were thrown at me over the past few months are loud and this world feels like it's just getting louder and louder and it's in that way that if we disagree which we're a country that's about a 50 50 split well if you disagree with me i'll yell louder apparently you didn't hear me so if i just get louder you'll understand a little bit better wait you still don't understand well let me talk a little bit louder that will make things better and then you yell back and this has become this world where this the hyperbole and the amount going back and forth has just kind of got dialed up it feels like to an 11. But at the same time, how many of us have felt alone in a world that seems loud? Which is a bit of a dichotomy, maybe. But I, I imagine it's probably a lot of people. Statistics are showing us that desolation and depression and despair are up significantly. Suicide rates, unfortunately, are as well. And it's a world that is making us feel alone. There's a prophet in the Old Testament who went through the same thing. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings 19. I love the prophet Elijah. His story is, I believe, a fascinating one. First Kings 19, as prelude to it, First Kings 18 is that wonderful story on Mount Carmel where Elijah comes up and uh, offers up the, you know, Ahab is the very, very terrible king of Israel at the time and, and prophets of Baal. And he, he challenges them to a duel, if you will, a, a my God's better than your God duel. And they go to the top of Mount Carmel, and he says, you build an altar, I'll build an altar. Go ahead, ask your God to start the fire. And they pray, and they dance, and they cut themselves, and it goes through a lot of different things, and it doesn't work. And then we know the story. Elijah prays to God. God brings down fire and not only starts uh, their altar, but also consumes the unrighteous uh, prophets of Baal in this show of, of great evidence that who is the righteous God? 
It was a loud event. This was a big event. This was what Elijah was hoping for. He had been, you know, three and a half years of, of uh, famine had been going on that God had brought, and he's hoping this is the catalyst. This is what's going to make the people turn to God. And 1 Kings 19 starts with the revelation that that was not the case. As Jezebel, who was the queen, the wife of Ahab, decides to try to have him killed and chases him, and Elijah is chased out into the wilderness, and he, he prays to God, just kill me. Just let me die. He is utterly depressed at this point. And God kind of sends him on the way. And we read here in verse 10, 1 Kings 19, in verse 10, we're kind of seeing now the state that Elijah was in after this event. He says, and he's speaking to God. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And seek to take my life. I alone. It's just me, God. I'm the only one left. He says this exact same phrase over in verse 14. He actually says it in, in chapter 18 as well. It's the third time that Elijah prays to God and says, it's just me. I'm the only one. Everybody else has turned their back. Everyone else is forsaking you. This world has gone crazy. The leadership won't turn to you. This world is not here for you, God. And it's I'm alone and left here. Please let me die. And that's Elijah's prayer to God. He had hoped that this show of force, this event on Mount Carmel the, of, of God saying, I am the true God and your gods can't even light a fire. And, the, and they don't have any power, but I do. He was hoping that would turn the tide and make the government understand what's going on. And it didn't work. You know, people reject God despite the evidence, not because of it. And he was confusing, didn't understand. It's like, how much louder can you yell than consuming fire that all the nations saw and the destruction of all the priests of Baal? Elijah had hoped these leaders, King Ahab, the people, those who were in power, would turn and do the right thing. In just four days on November 3rd, this Tuesday, our nation will have an election. If you hadn't heard or not, I know it, it hasn't been in the news at all. <laughs> But there's going to be an election on Tuesday, and if you've driven by any polling place near where you live, there is a line out into the street, across the street, and it's probably blocking traffic. I'm joking, but it's actually not really the case. I really were blocking traffic in Brownsburg as I tried to drive to my office the other day. Anybody who thinks whatever happens when we wake up on Wednesday the 4th, if we even know by then at all, that whatever happens on either side or in any way is going to become and turn our country righteous and turn the people back to God and help people understand what we should do and how we should ask forgiveness for our sins, we'll be sorely disappointed. That's not going to happen no matter who wins from the president to the senator to the county commissioner down to the superior court judge and anything in between, even at school board. It's, it's not going to turn our world around. It's not going to turn our country around. And that's what Elijah was hoping for here. He thought this moment in, ch in chapter 18 was going to turn the people back. It was going to give them the impetus to return to who God was. But now Elijah, seeing this, had lost some of his strength, which was what he was so good at. That's what Elijah was so powerful at. If you read, obviously, if you read 1 Kings, we all know the story of this great prophet. He was one of the strong, and now he had lost that faith. You know, think about that in the Old Testament as a bit of a side effect. How many people of God who had these wonderful gifts, their main failing ended up being their gift. You know, Solomon had this wisdom unless it came to his wives. You know, Moses was such a meek individual and was chosen for that, but when he lost his temper, he lost the chance to carry the people into the promised land. Moses, or sorry, Moses, uh, Solomon, uh, who was it? Abraham lost his faith at incidents. Job lost his patience. All these people who are known for these great things sometimes our greatest strength can also be our greatest weakness. And here Elijah is just saying, I'm done. Please just let me die. I can't do any more. But then comes the kicker. So we read verse 10. Go on to verse 11. And then he said, he here is, is God as we're picking up the story. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And before, behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Let's stop there. These are some pretty big events. A wind so powerful it can destroy mountains. These are hurricane, gale force winds that could break a mountain. That's pretty loud. 
but God wasn't there. A fire, an earthquake that shook the ground, loud events, just like what had happened here earlier on chapter 18 of the, of the, the event at Mount Carmel. Big, loud events, like this is, must be where God is. And it wasn't the case, picking up, and it says, after the fire, a still, small voice, a scripture all of us likely have somewhat highlighted in our Bible as it's this wonderful little piece of, of the end of the scripture. It wasn't those big things. It wasn't these loud events. Sometimes God is in, if we take the time to stop, and he's there when we listen, if we can put out the loud. He is not always in these big flamboyant events. He is not always in these things that shake the world, be they physical, be they mental, be they emotional or whatnot. But if we can take the time as Elijah just stopped for a second, was able to listen and put away everything else that was around him, he heard that still small voice. How often have we been disappointed because what we expected was not the case? You know, I, I think... You go to the New Testament, how many people thought the first coming of Christ was going to be this large, momentous event that would you know, shake the world just as much, but instead Christ was born in a manger in Bethlehem that no one even knew. And so when he comes on the scene preaching later in his life, obviously in his 20s, all these people didn't think, who is this guy? He, can't have, he could not have been the son of God because we have all these preconceived notions of who the son of God would be. This can't be him. This is a simple little man. But their preconceived notions kept them from hearing through these loud events and understanding and hearing that still small voice that was there. If we look for God in the large, we can sometimes miss him in the small. And so Elijah is comforted. And right after this, leading through the rest of the chapter here, God gives him now two things. First thing is he gives him hope. Oh, skipping over to verse 18, he says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every month, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You are not alone, Elijah. You just didn't know it. But I have 7,000 other people who have not worshipped Baal, whose heads I know, whose prayers I've heard, who are just like you. And they might be feeling alone too, but they're with you. You're not the last one. You're not the last one on this earth who thinks that I, I am God and follows my ways. You're not alone. And there are others, and they will be there just as much and will continue to grow. He gives them hope. He lets them know he's not alone. That's a huge thing as you, could, as you read through this of Elijah in the depths of his lowest he is in his entire earthly ministry. He gets a bit of hope. And secondly, he gets a purpose. God tells him to go find in this scripture, he tells him, go find Elisha. I'm not only going to, there's 7,000 other people out there, but I'm going to give you one other person to work with daily a protege, if you will, another prophet, to go anoint and raise up. He will be your replacement, but he'll be with you every day. And I'm going to give you a purpose to your ministry, something to work on. He, gives, he goes through many scriptures here that tells him, here's what you're going to go do and all the things. He, he not only tells him, there's other people, now I'm going to give you a helper, so you're not even going to be alone day to day. It's not just going to be you wandering through trying to you know, escape Jezebel, but I'm going to give you hope and other people, and I'm going to give you a purpose now, and you and Elisha are going to go forward and hear all the things you're going to do. And Elijah is taken from down here all of a sudden to a pretty high spot really quick, just like that, when he took the time to listen, when he took the time to put out the loud. When we put away the loud, whatever it is in our life, the political ads, people at work, sometimes family members, especially little kids, I did point over there, but I probably shouldn't have because that's where mine are. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever that is that is in your life that's loud, whatever it is that is drowning out everything else in society or drowning out where you should have your focus, take the time to listen to the quiet, and you too can have hope and purpose.